life will always bring you on a roller coaster ride. I'm navigating through each and every day and loving what is and what the future may hold. My past has given me amazing memories and untold stories, and at times feeling of worry and hardship, which I now see as part of my life journey. Remember, show up, and if you fail, that's okay. Tomorrow will bring a new day and new ideas. I've had the privilege to spend time and interview some amazing leaders over the years. As they share their stories of life and business, I find out what makes them the people they are. I'm honored to share their stories with you. Are you being authentic and unique in everything you do or are you living a life that others expect of you? It's time to step up and shine. Be the real you, stir that great awakening inside and trust the process. Want to know how you can do this? Go to joedalton.ie forward slash discover. On this week's show, we have Patrick Daly. Patrick Daly is the founder and managing director of Alba Consulting, a Dublin-based business consultancy focused on supply chain and logistics. Patrick is an accomplished consultant, speaker, trainer, author, and broadcaster, and has been active in the logistics and supply chain field for over 25 years. Patrick has consulted with Fortune 500 companies in manufacturing, distribution, and logistics services all over the world. He is the author of the book, International Supply Chain Relationships. Patrick Daly, welcome to Breakthrough Brands. How are you? Delighted to be here. Once again. Once, once again, again. Second time. Second time. I think the first time was, God, it's maybe. over a year. Yeah, uh, two years. Two years. Two and a half years. I'm maybe. doing the show nearly three years. Could be, yeah. Could be. Patrick Daly, European's top logistic consultant. You're very kind. You are. And, you know, the companies that you deal with, the circles that you move in as well, and the knowledge and the experience you have in channel management and logistics. You know, people are knocking on your doors, and especially with what's happening with Brexit and what's happening with globalization. The world is getting smaller. People are trying to step into other countries to grow their business. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot going on in the world, lots of changes, and uh, businesses have to respond to those changes. So in, in Ireland, particularly, uh, Irish-owned businesses have depended a lot for export in the United Kingdom. And that's a situation that over the last three years they have known that that situation may not be able to continue to the same extent. So they have to diversify. So not necessarily that they would export less to the UK, but that they would increase the proportion of their exports that would go to other countries. You've just come back. You've had you know, you're in the Mexican embassy having lunch. You've been over to Eastern Europe speaking there at conferences. You were invited into Dublin, into a lot of the, the delegates last summer were over from all the East European countries and you were guests there as well. And mm-hmm. you speak with Enterprise Ireland. So you're the go-to guy when a company kind of wants, OK, how do we expand our business? Not only how do we expand our business, but what do we need to do in the warehouses as well to get that ready? Yeah, well, a big part of doing business internationally is logistics and supply chain. Um, So unless you're in a purely digital business, you have materials and products that have to be moved. Um, And increasingly, those movements take place across international borders. And particularly when those borders are outside the European Union, there's a lot more complexity involved. And then you have companies who begin uh, their experience exporting and exporting is a continuum that if you're successful will take you in time to being uh, an investor in many cases in an overseas market. So for example, uh, yesterday the meeting with the the Mexican ambassador and the commercial attaché in the embassy, we were talking precisely about that and there were a number of Irish business people there who have been exporting to that part of the world and their business has reached a point now that they need to think about having an entity inside Mexican territory and they need to get set up, uh, they need to find people 
Um, they need to find a location and they need to work out the supply chains in terms of getting the materials and exporting the products. Like you were there last year as well in Mexico. I was in Mexico in in August last year. I went to, uh, in, in this case, on behalf of some clients in the food industry, I went to a fair called um, Mexico Alimentaria, which is a food food fair. And uh, the clients, the Irish clients, were particularly interested in in sourcing avocados from uh, from Mexico, which is the world's largest and the world's best um, producer of, uh, of of avocados, and again, um, huge logistical challenges in getting a fresh product uh, from Mexico to to Europe, because. <clears throat> up until the Mexicans are facing a similar situation to the Irish in the sense that they live beside a very a very large partner, and traditionally they have depended very much on that partner. And in the same way that Britain has taken uh, a hard left turn and is going in a different direction from us, the United States, with regard to Mexico, um, with the election of President Trump in 2016, has taken a different turn with regard to Mexico. And uh, the free trade agreements and so on are being questioned. And there's the impending imposition of of uh, tariffs on Mexico. So Mexico as well is looking for diversification of their business and their exports. Which in a way is a good thing for, for the likes of ourselves because instead of knocking on the door who which now is possibly closing and as you said they're looking for alternatives as your as your book which we'll talk about is globalization. It really yeah, well, is. In, in, in in the same way that if you're if you're investing in in assets as a as a as a person uh, you'll be advised by your financial advisor to have maybe some money in stocks, some money in property, maybe some money in other types of assets in gold or whatever uh, to diversify your your risk. And in the same way, Irish companies that have been uh, exporting 80% of their exports to the United Kingdom, that puts them in a very vulnerable position. Um, so the diversification of their exports is going to make them much more robust in the long term, even if it's uncomfortable in the short term. Uh, and many have, have saw the writing on the wall when the uh, referendum result came through, or some even before that, and began that process. So I would say that we're in a much better position in terms of the diversification of the exports of Irish-owned companies today than we were in 2016. But there's still an awful lot more work to do in that, in that regard. And, and one of the benefits with yourself as well, how many languages do you speak? Well, I spent 10 years living and working in, in Spain. Yeah. I went to Spain when I was 21 and um, I married uh, Lisa, a, a Spanish lady. And um, because when, when we met, uh, in 1986, Elisa didn't speak um, English, so we, we met in Spain. <clears throat> uh, we began our relationship in Spanish, and we've kept it that way until today. Even though we've been living in Dublin, yeah, speak Dublin in for now 20 years, so we yeah. speak Spanish in 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 the home. So Sp I'm as, as comfortable in Spanish, to be honest, as I am in English, doing business or or living my uh, relationship life or or whatever. Um, I'm. You know, people say Portuguese is the same as Spanish. It isn't. Uh, it's quite. It's quite different, particularly, particularly spoken. And I'm I'm working very hard on Portuguese at the moment and making quite a lot of progress. Um, also got to a reasonably good level of uh, of Italian and then the French from from back at school. So I suppose. You know, in terms of fluency, English and Spanish. In terms of, you know, I can get, I can get by. Maybe, maybe three more. Three more, like honest, yeah. yeah. You know, you're a grafter. You're a good guy that made it good. You went to you're making me blush now. No, you? but yeah, making you blush. Really hard to make you blush. You got a hard neck. You're a guy from Dunleary who went off, travelled, learned to trade, came back to Ireland, set up a business. Had a failure in business, set something up, and it failed. Mm -hmm. And from that failure came wisdom yep. and from there probably a wake up call for you as well to go out and do it on your own and be successful on your own as well how long is Alba Logistics going now? Uh, since 2005 early 2005 so that's what 14, 14 years, years now so yeah. tell us a little bit before that what happened to make you now the success that you are? Well, I suppose when I came back from Spain in the mid uh, '90s, Ireland was was doing well. So it was I was I was lucky in the sense that I, I came into a country that was on the on the up and up at that time, and uh, I had come back to 
to a job. Uh, I thought it was a job, but uh, in fact it was a contract. And um, uh, I worked on that contract for a time, and then I realised, well, if, you know, if I'm just a contractor here, I can be doing work for for other people. So it was first the realisation that. Um, you know, you didn't necessarily have to be locked into a job and to sell your whole time and life to one individual business. So that was one one realization. Um, later, uh, I did form a business on my own, and then later we had we had partners and went through that process, which was very successful for a while and then not so successful. And out of that, I learned uh, maybe that I had leadership qualities that I hadn't realized. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and that came about because people started saying it, saying it to me, uh, and then in the in the failure of that business, which could be part of the fact that you didn't realise um, how you were you were leading or should lead, um, I came to realise that I I had a lot more capability um, than I realised. I didn't necessarily need to have business partners, and I could go on my own again. And I started again. So it was a series of, of realizations of kind of self awareness, um, and, and the big meandering of yeah. Well, you see, I, I think a big a big uh, limitation that a lot of people have, and I had, and and still have, because this is always a process, is um, issues related to self esteem, and it's an unending it's an unending process of of learning, and it's often lack of self-esteem not a hundred percent but in different aspects of what we do that holds us back and um, working through that that process I think has been the kind of uh, opening of the gates to new levels of performance new levels of opportunity new levels of development yeah it's interesting you say that because as you know I, I do a lot of consultancy with a lot of uh, consultants and I'm finding and it's right across the board if you go to anyone the biggest issue that a lot of people have is self-esteem, the imposter syndrome, and these are evolving back to when, you know, the, the word that you learn when you're a child is no, 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 and don't talk to strangers, you know, and then you have to suddenly, when you go into business, you have to talk to people, but oh my God, they're a stranger, because <laughs> <laughs> they're going to buy stuff from me. But then it's also a case of, you know, believing in yourself and understanding that you're unique in your own way and developing that uniqueness because people then will will, yeah. will I, I, resonate I, towards it. Yeah, I have a business uh, mentor and coach and he says to me, the first sale is to yourself. Yeah. Um, so you have to believe yourself and part of believing yourself is to, to, to know genuinely that what you're proposing to the person you have in front of you, particularly in consultancy business, is that you are convinced that what you are proposing to that person is in their best interest. Um, and that's, that's a genuine mindset. And if you have that genuine mindset, well, then you don't have to be self-conscious about yourself because you're there for the benefit of the, of the client. Um, and I think that kind of approach, as opposed to trying to peddle something to somebody that they may or may not need, um, it's a very different, different. Yeah, approach. because it's 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 transparency, and you know, it's your values, you know, ethically what you're doing. But it's also a case of really kind of not trying to do stuff to benefit you. It's to do stuff to help that other person. Mm-hmm. That's what it is at it, and it's, I suppose it, 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 there is a self interest, but it's an enlightened self interest in the sense that if you think. Um, Back to the days after the Second World War, when Europe was on its feet, and uh, the Americans rolled out the Marshall Plan, which was uh, a major investment in the, the, the countries of Europe that had been destroyed. So that was in their self-interest, but it was an enlightened self-interest. It was also in the self-interest of the country, countries they rebuilt, uh, such as Germany, which had been their 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 enemy, but also other other countries, Italy as well, um, uh, France, and uh, many of other countries benefited from the from the Marshall Plan. So yeah, I'm not trying to say you know there's no self-interest. There is, but it's an enlightened self-interest. Yeah. You've published a book, International Supply Chain Relationships. And it's to do with the globalized economy and the advantages that companies can have if they want to grow their business. Mm-hmm. And I know you used to you used to specialize mainly in technical advisory, and now you're getting into more of a consultant advisory. 
Yeah, uh, the the distinction, I guess, would be in the past, uh, a lot of the work, because I come from an engineering background, was quite quite technical. And uh, it was quite tactical in the sense it was, you know, solving particular practical problems in, in operations, mostly. And uh, o- over time, with the evolution of, of, of the business, the evolution of the relationship with the, with the clients, the business has become more... Uh, of a of a, a mix with uh, advisory type services, whereby rather than teaching, uh, so rather than catching the fish for the client, we're teaching the client to catch the fish for themselves, and that, uh, although it's less labour intensive for us, is of more value uh, to the client because you leave them with the capability to do many of these things for themselves. And then the next time when you engage, you're engaging on something of a higher uh, level of value with them. So we have no self-consciousness about transferring um, know-how or capability uh, to the client so that they can fend for themselves in the future on the same type of issues. Do you sort of find that when you're going into organisations, because I know you've been doing this a long time, and you can spot things quickly that organisations haven't been looking at because they're sort of caught up on other issues within the business, that you can go in and what are the, the fundamentals that you know where they want to go but is blocking them? Um, well, in, in, in practical terms, there can be m- many practical issues that, that manifest, but the, the, the commonality of issues uh, that I come across is sometimes people find it difficult uh, to frame uh, what exactly it is they're trying to achieve uh, in a, in a su- succinct way and to develop uh, an understanding of what the value of reaching those objectives would be. And then knowing how to detect if they're making progress towards those objectives. So it doesn't matter what it what it might be. That process is the same. And the con- first conversation is often around those three things. What are the objectives? It's a clarification. Uh, so oftentimes, what the what the client describes to you needs some. Um, uh, work, if you like, to unearth exactly what it is they're trying to achieve in terms of business outcomes. You know, whether it's a growth thing, whether it's a cost saving thing, whether it's an increase in capability, staff retention, uh, compliance, uh, so on. Uh, So objectives is the first. The second is the value. So if you can achieve these objectives, what does that mean for you uh, as an executive? What does it mean for the business? And what's the value of that? Um, Partly uh, in qualitative terms, but also in quantitative terms. So how can we monetize that? And then we say, okay, well, if those are the objectives and this is the, the value of achieving those objectives, how would we know that we were making progress from where we are to where we want to go to? And that's about developing a number of metrics or measures that we can use as we're working together to detect that we're making uh, progress t- towards those objectives. And that's that's the fundamental basis on which any of these uh, consultancy arrangements are entered into, whether they're technical uh, and tactical or whether they're more strategic and advisory. That's always the, the same process. And um, I think the fundamental issue often is that people have difficulty in trying to frame that clearly. Uh, and, when, and when you do, well, then you can, um, uh, you can work very successfully together with an understanding, a kind of a trust that we're working in each other's best interest. Do you find the same issues are always appearing with Irish companies that want to expand or is each one is totally different? There are common common threads. Uh, Irish owned companies, because they tend to be um, small to medium sized for the the most part, and even those that are large, not so long ago were small or medium sized and, and many of them still... I guess retain that 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 DNA of the of the SME. Um, so often they're they're challenged in terms of um, access to capital. Uh, they're often challenged uh, as well in terms of access to 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 skills. Um, in terms of international business, the Irish are very gregarious, um, very good at getting out there, um, 
but they what about the culture end of it you know when they're stepping into another country are they doing that research on the culture aspects or are they just you know like we know like the Germans the Germans plan for two hours and then they run the project the Mm -hmm. Irish run the project and firefight as they go along uh, well, yeah, I think I think the Irish are uh, probably not that that, that extreme. Um, I think I think they do prepare. Uh, what I would say about the Irish is that we we tend to look to other places that that speak English because we're not great uh, when we step outside the kind of uh, Anglo-Saxon world in terms of particularly when you're when you're selling. So you know if you're if you're buying, that's 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 fine. You know you can go to to Italy or Spain or France or Russia or wherever, speak English and expect to be dealt with in English. But if you're if you're selling, uh, so for example, yesterday I was talking to a CEO uh, who's looking to do business in in Spain, and um, she's going to have to engage with the Spanish on their terms, um, and some of their. Ob- executives will speak English but not everybody that she engages with will will speak English so she's going to need to understand uh, a bit more about the culture maybe of one or two Spanish people in her team or one or two Spanish speakers in in her team uh, and work a lot on the on the relationship so I think it, it, it shows through in our trade figures you know we do an awful lot of business uh, with, with the UK and then we do an awful lot of business with the US uh, and then when you look at the, the figures, you see countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on coming up. So, you know, we have we have a bit to do there. But it's but it's yeah. But even if you look, let's go back where we were speaking in the first half of the show about Eastern Europe. So they're all speaking English. You know, it's the the, the majority of the people that are coming through and all. It's all English. So that market is is opening up. But it's where you come in as well because. You're you speak fluent in Spanish. You you've as I say you, you travel all over the world to uh, advise large organisations on developing their business. And a company that wants to expand, or I don't see why would they not go? Okay, we need to get Patrick in because we want to step into another organisation, another country that doesn't speak English. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, uh, if if. Um you ask the question, why? Why, why don't they? Yeah, just a question. Why don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some t- and and they often do. Yeah, they often do. Yeah, and um, it, but it, it's it's getting to know you and getting to know the industry. And you know, we have a, 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 we both have a very good friend, Damien McNally, who, if I asked him what is channel management, and he'd go, what? <laughs> you know, but what what I'm getting at is, it's sort of an industry that a lot of people don't know about. It's like the automotive trade. Everyone thinks in the automotive trade, they think cars. But behind that, there's all these functional businesses and dealer management systems that are flying through that are basically multi-million dollar industries. And your industry as well, it's sort of that under the radar that normal consumer doesn't actually know exists. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Companies, I suppose, when they internationalize, they often... Um, take baby steps and they and they learn as they go and they might not necessarily uh, have a view of what all the options are um, and how to evaluate all of the options because if you're entering a, a foreign market there are many ways you can you can do that from having uh, an agent a distributor uh, a joint venture partner um, or going in direct and um, you know the, the strategy that you adopt is going to make huge differences to your financial requirements, uh, your skills requirements, your personnel requirements, your transport and logistics requirements. Yeah, because when you think logistics, you know, God, logistics throws up so many different organisations, trucks, buses. Do you know, it's like you're throwing consultant into Google and you get a, you know, it's everything under the sun. And the same with the word logistics, isn't it? It's yeah, well, um, what has grown up over the last number of decades is the role of the logistics service provider. So there are a number of specialist companies um, that provide services to business uh, that include many of those tasks and activities like transport and warehousing and customs clearance and freight forwarding. Um, and and many others, some even 
do vendor management. Some even take over procurement and purchasing. So there's a whole range of services available. But the thing is for each individual business to know what they need and what suits them. Yeah, so logistics, as you say, it's a, it's a wide, big name and lots of services. But I would say for yourself, it, your niche, but you're actually even going into super niche. Well, I, I suppose in in a way, uh, what we do is specialise. But when you think about it, we, we we end up working in every sector imaginable. So you know, I've worked in timber, I've worked in coal, I've worked in pharma, I've worked in medical devices, I've worked in food, I've worked in in beverage. And the reason for that is, everybody who has some sort of physical uh, product um, that requires movement and handling. Uh, that is our niche. So, um, you know, logistics and supply chain might be a relatively specialist field, but it ex- extends right across the spectrum of business. Uh, yeah, it, it's right across the business. But when I say super niche, you're not the one fit all logistics shop going, oh, get me a truck here or get me a vendor here. You, you're going in and you're advising a company on, on how they can grow their business. Well, I guess we, we're a pure consultancy business in the sense that we, we, we don't sell... Um, transport services to anybody. We don't sell warehousing services to anybody. We don't sell any products to anybody. We don't sell any software to anybody. What we're doing is working with clients uh, to help them achieve business objectives. And as I said earlier, those business objectives might be in terms of achieving growth and achieving profitability and achieving capability and so on. So what we're helping them to do is to uh, conceive formulate and implement strategies that are going to deliver that for the business. And sometimes that involves them bringing in or procuring vendors of equipment or technology, uh, service providers of, of one type or another. And we ha- may help them to do that, yeah. but, 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 but we are now part of no, that, yeah. that service. Yeah. But, but even going through the book, even though the book is you know, supply chain, there's so many, if you if you read between the lines, a lot of this can be used in different organisations that are not involved in supply chain because the knowledge in it is, is if you think outside the box, it's, oh, I could use that for that. Yeah, well, there are, uh, a lot of what's in there is, is process. Yeah. And process is transferable regardless of the content. Um, so we're using processes uh, that we apply to the area of uh, supply chain and logistics, but just as easily you could apply some of those processes to, to product development um, or service development. Um, so th- th- I guess that, that, that is the, um, the, the underpinning of what we do is robust process. And, and the beauty of it as well, it's 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 not a book that you pick up and have a read and go okay here's a book to have a read and now I'll sleep lovely tonight. It's a book that is creative that I believe if if anyone in the industry reads the book, mm-hmm. it'll spark creative ideas for them that they'll stop and make a note and go I need to try and do that. Yeah. Well, I, I like to put everything we do. Uh, but you off. haven't you haven't what I'm trying to get at, Patrick. You haven't held back. <laughs> you've given, you've given, you know, you've you've basically given everything in it. Well, there's more, there's more to there come. There is more, more to come. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm writing the second book now. So, but I, I guess the point um, I w- wanted to make is that everything w- we do, and, and what I try to do with clients as well, is everything sits in a context of something, and we are now in a in a world that's changing rapidly, technologically, politically, sociologically, uh, and so on. And we see the manifestation of that in globalization and so on. And um, so in the in the book, I'm touching on aspects of that uh, of what what is economic uh, globalization how does the geography of where we are and where we put our facilities affect that where you put your factories where you put your warehouses how does the culture uh, that we have our national culture and a particular organizational culture affect how well we're going to do in the future um, what are the relationships that we need to build if you, if you think back uh, to the day, particularly before the 1970s, businesses tended to own everything that they did. They were vertically integrated. So everybody from the cleaning staff uh, to the transport company 
um, to their factory. Sometimes in extreme cases, they owned mines and, 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 and rubber plantations like the Ford Motor Company back in the 20s. They were vertically integrated and they exercised control and integration through ownership. Today, companies are not like that anymore, but they still need control and integration of their supply chain and they do it through relationship. And the quality uh, and the nature of the relationships that they build with all of these people, suppliers, service providers, agents, uh, uh, the authorities, customs authorities, fiscal authorities, the quality of those relationships is going to be what determines how successful they are and how competitive they are in the market. And a lot of companies, I think, struggle, even some of the very biggest ones struggle with just how to triage those relationships, how to break them down and how to manage them because not all relationships are created equal and they need different management paradigms for managing different relationships depending on whether they're shorter term, longer term, whether they are more or less complex and whether the power relationship with me to the supply chain partner is that the partner's more powerful than I am or I'm more powerful than he is. And those three different axes of the relationship give rise to a lot of um, uh, complexity in terms of how companies manage their their supply chains. And we're doing a lot of interesting work in that, that, that field at the moment. There's a big talk as well within the industries and you look about with artificial intelligence. Is artificial intelligence having a major play within warehouses as well and in the distribution? Uh, it's 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 coming. You know, there's a lot of hype about artificial intelligence, and and a lot of it is 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 overdone. So a lot of the talk you, you hear uh, and the fear mongering is about a thing called artificial general intelligence, which would be artificial intelligence that basically has human attributes. Um, there there is. There is no clear route today to that kind of artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence that does exist uh, are algorithms that are able to see patterns in data that humans can't see and make predictions from those um, uh, from those correlations that they see in the data. And that can look quite impressive, um, but it isn't it isn't the type of um, uh, artificial intelligence that's going to substitute humans. So in in warehouse operations, uh, some of the limitations are that uh, r- robotics and artificial intelligence are still limited in terms of the dexterity. So the type of dexterity we have with our with our fingers uh, and the, the vision in our eyes is still very difficult to to replicate in in robotics and artificial intelligence. But but we are seeing robots in in warehouses particularly for transporting uh, items to humans who do, then do the dexterous work uh, uh, at the end. And Amazon is a great great That's example of yeah. that. Um, uh, we're seeing uh, better and more sensitive um, robotics. You're seeing um, machines now called cobots, collaborative robots, where the sensors are so good that they can work in close proximity, proximity to people in collaborative tasks without harming the human. Um, we're seeing a lot of a lot of that coming. Um, so yeah, I think I think AI and robotics is going to be prominent in logistics and, and supply chain, say inside inside the warehouse and also outside on the on the road in terms of autonomous vehicles. But you know, th- there there is fear that there'll be many people displaced from from jobs in the future. But the reality at the moment in Ireland and many developed countries is it's proving ever harder to get people uh, who want to work in in warehousing, uh, uh, forklift drivers, uh, HGV drivers, yeah. and many of the people who who are working in those roles today are of a certain age, and young people are not coming through because everybody's going to college, everybody wants to do a degree and and have a have a different type of of career. So the sociological, technological interplay there is very, very interesting. When I went to school back in the 1970s, um, in their geography books, we used to have these graphs of world population, and it was an exponential graph that went ever higher. It actually didn't turn out that way. And the growth in world population now is slowing rapidly. 
Mm. And the world population is going to peak sometime in the 21st century and it's going to start declining on a worldwide basis. And it's already started to decline in, in, in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. In Western Europe and Northern Europe, where we are, our populations are still growing. But part of that is people migrating from Southern and Eastern Europe coming coming here. And part of it is, you know, we have higher rates of, of fertility. Um, but the age profile of the populations are changing. We're becoming older. There are fewer younger people coming through. And the young people that are coming through uh, don't necessarily want to be doing those types of jobs and it's and we see it in the economy everywhere I go and it doesn't matter whether it's a, a small Irish distribution company or whether it's a large multinational company uh, running their own internal logistics operations they're having great difficulty finding people for those for those roles and um, so on the one hand you have the fear of automation and AI displacing people but on the other side you have it's difficult to get people anyway so you know it's the it, it depends it depends on the, the speed that, that AI comes on stream you know look we're coming to the end I, I want to ask you what is your feeling your gut feeling of where Ireland will stand in a global economy in the next 10 years uh, I'm quite optimistic about about Ireland uh, as you know I, I, I do travel a lot um, I have lived in, in other countries um, and when I came back to Ireland uh, at the age of kind of 30 having been away for 10 years it was it was a big chunk of my life uh, away and I was impressed with the Ireland I came back to I was impressed with the flexibility and the openness of people in, in general I was impressed with how um, cosmopolitan the country had become, how business oriented it had become, more of a kind of a can-do uh, attitude. I left here in the mid-80s and it was it was pretty bleak uh, at, oh, yeah. at, at, at that time. Um, and, and I think um, in the intervening period, notwithstanding the big recession we had in, in um, you know, from 2008 onwards, uh, Ireland has done well, continues to do well, and I think it will do well. And Despite the fact, you know, we spoke about demographics and declining populations, Ireland's population continues to grow and will grow by maybe another million people over the next 20 years or so. So our specific weight in Europe is going to increase, mm. even though we are a small player in Europe. We're going to get be, be that bit bigger in relation to the others. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic for Ireland's future. As I say, it's Ireland, I think it's going to be a beacon of light in a world of madness. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> There's some signs maybe that the, madness, that the madness is turning back to sanity. What's the best book that you would recommend for someone to read? Well, I read a lot of books, okay. but one that I'm reading... Um, at the moment that I'm that I'm enjoying, I don't agree with everything in it, um, but it's about artificial intelligence, and uh, it's written by a Taiwanese American called uh, Kai Fu Lee, who worked for Microsoft and worked for for Google, and he's now a venture capitalist in in China and investing a lot in uh, in artificial intelligence, and he's written this book called uh, AI Superpowers, okay. and uh, it's a great overview of AI from somebody who's who's been in the the business from the from the beginning, um, and he again touches on some of the demographic and sociological uh, aspects. And as I said, I don't agree with everything, but I think it's a great great read, and he gives great perspectives on the as on the future. Best business advice: uh, Believe in yourself. Uh, the first sale is to yourself. It is, yeah, mm. that's true. And your book, I think it's a read for anyone, even people that aren't in logistics. I think it's it's a knowledgeable book for anyone that's in business. Yeah, really. well, there's, we're talking there about geography, we talk globalisation, we talk yeah, culture, yeah. relationship. Where can people get it? They can get it on my publisher's website, which is uh, koganpage.com, and they can also pick it up on... Um, Amazon, Google and Apple Books. And your website address? albalogistics.com. It's A L B A logistics.com. I think there's a link on it there as well for that you can there is. get to on it. Yes. It's a book that's going to be really academic really, isn't it? It's, it's I think it, it probably flips both ways. Um it's a book that uh, an executive would read. It's a book maybe that uh, a university um lecturer might might dip yeah. into or recommend for the for for students, and it's a book that people who are just interested in in business uh, and international business and wh where the world is going in terms of business, I think would get something from it also. Patrick, give us a song to play out with. So one of my favourite uh, songs, um, which uh, 
I picked up, I think, probably from somebody related to you. Uh, it was by the group Steely Dan. And a great tune it is. And uh, the song is Ricky Don't Lose That Number. Yes, dancing to it the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Daly, thanks for coming on to Break Two Brands. You're very welcome. Thank you, Joe. If you have a change